welcome again to our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. It couldn't be prettier out our windows. A little bit about future speakers. Um, how many of you have heard of the Navy SEALs? How many have heard about Army Rangers? Okay, well, come by in the beginning of March and you'll meet the guy who ended up number one in the international competition that all these special forces have from the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, number one in the competition called Ranger One Competition. We'll be here to speak on March the 4th. After being, um, after serving multiple tours in the Middle East, uh, he then won the Ranger One Competition worldwide, came out and became a San Mateo policeman where he works with disadvantaged youth. And then he founded a 501c3 called Ranger Road. It's terrific. And uh, he'll talk all about his new mission in life. And then on February 26th, Marie Bird will be here to talk all about the Coast Guard. She's head of the San Francisco station. And then um, next week on February 19th, uh, another, these are all very great programs in my opinion. Uh, we'll hear all about the incredible raid uh, of Bird at the beginning of World War II. After Pearl Harbor, America caught completely off guard, had to figure out what to do next. And in the eyes of our speaker, one of the bravest people in the country, takes off on what is in all likelihood a suicide mission. And for the first time has a bomber take off from an aircraft carrier, from an aircraft carrier and fly into Japan without a clear way to get back. Uh, so that incredible story will be told by a very thoughtful international lawyer who's also part of the Navy League. So Bruce Jennigan will give us that story. Now a little bit about our speaker today. Who started sailing when they were 13? Our speaker and yours truly. The difference is that he started a sunfish, I started a little eight foot four inch sloop rig scow. And at the age of 20, having already received our speaker had four, count them four full ride scholarships in track and field, pole vault. By that time he could jump around 16.9 in the pole vault, or vault 69. He bailed on and quit college for the fourth time to go sailing. He realized he had to do something about this sailing crave that his mother saw in him and he saw in himself. And before he could really do anything active about it though, his mother said, I'll make you a deal. You study hard and work hard and when uh, you earn enough money to buy a sailboat, I'll give you a matching grant. So he basically uh, bought a, a boat at age 21 and 300,000 miles a year later, he's in his 40th consecutive year of cruising the world. We couldn't really find a more qualified speaker to tell us all about it. John Kretschmer, come on up, John. Good on you, buddy, good on you. Very much. The last Instagram post that I made was two weeks ago. It was that day, 36 years before, that we rounded Cape Horn in a little 32-foot loop called Gigi. And the irony of that is, is that I'm not even sure actually how to access my Instagram, but my beautiful wife, who's lurking around here somewhere, posts for me. Um, but what was really interesting is that voyage was from New York to San Francisco, and we stumbled under the Golden Gate Bridge 162 days outbound from New York. Um, the trip was comprised of three legs, and the last leg was from Valparaiso, Chile, right here to Pier 39. And we had kind of provisioned and expected that last leg to last maybe 50 days. And it was 72 days of sailing. And it was a, it's a long time to be on a 32-foot boat, especially with a guy you don't really like that much. And, uh, and I not only didn't bring enough food, but I didn't bring enough to read. And by the uh, 50th day, I had devoured every printed thing on the boat, including the, the labels on the last canned lima beans, which were... <laughs> the last bit of food we had. So Oz, my, my shipmate, he, uh, we resorted to playing Yahtzee. And every game was going to be worth a beer when we got to San Francisco. And at some point, he owed me 800 beers. And I said, look, let's, let's do double or nothing. This is crazy. So when he owed me 1,600 beers, I said, let's stop. He goes, no, 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 I'm going to win every one of those damn beers back, one game at a time. Anyway, we... Uh, we set out to retrace the route of the clipper ships. And you know, the clipper ships are such a storied part of San Francisco. 
our, our goal was not to beat Flying Clouds record or anything like that, but we wanted to beat the, or sail the average time. Wow, that's a really nice vista on the world. What is that, an old Bristol? <laughs> um, going out to sea. But we wanted to sail the entire 12,000 mile route in 120 days. That was the average time of a gold ship, of a gold rush clipper ship. And we didn't do that. We were 162 days. In fact, um, we didn't really establish any records worth mentioning or any of the records we did worth that we did establish had a lot of asterisks after them. But we did something really smart. We arrived in San Francisco on a slow news day. That was back in the age before the 24-hour news cycle. And for some crazy reason, our voyage aboard Gigi became newsworthy. And as we stumbled into Pier 39, feeling pretty groggy and looking pretty groggy, there was a little makeshift celebration set up. And Mayor, then Mayor Feinstein was there to welcome us to the city and give us the keys to San Francisco. Well, she was sort of there. She was in her limo kind of sizing up the situation and realized that the crowd and the whole thing wasn't actually worth getting wet over. So she sent out her assistant to give us the keys to the city. <laughs> so he comes out of the limo, he's got his trench coat over his head and he says, okay, let's get this over with. And so he reads this proclamation from the mayor. I shake his hand and he hands me the keys. And they're these big red keys, right? And I've haven't been ashore for 72 days. I'm a little wobbly on my feet and I dropped them. And unlike today, it was a typical windy San Francisco day and the keys start blowing down the dock and they're gonna blow right in the water. So I scurry after them and step on them only to realize they were styrofoam and I crushed the keys to the city. <laughs> but that started a very unexpected two weeks of being famous. I, uh, I went to my hotel room after that and phone rang and it was the first phone call I'd received in about six months and I pick up the phone and, and this lady says can you hold for Dan Rather and I said yeah okay sure so sure enough Dan comes on the phone and he says welcome home Don we're really proud of you here at CBS News I said thanks a lot Dan it's John by the way but you know and I appreciate that <laughs> He says, you know, we'd really like to have you on our new CBS Morning News show tomorrow morning over here on West 57th Street. And I said, you know, that's great, Dan. I'm, I'm actually in San Francisco, though. And he says, uh, well, um, oh, anyway, great job, Don. <laughs> so his producer comes on the phone and she says, we know you're in San Francisco. He's an idiot. Don't worry about it. We're, we're going to have a limo outside your hotel room in two hours. We're going to put you up at the, in the Essex house if you'll come on the show. So sure enough, limo comes out, and next day I'm in New York, and I go on TV. And the, the thing is, I was so utterly broke. I had literally, I was 24 years old, and I had spent every last dime, I mean, right down to the last one, doing this trip. So... I would hover around the Essex house door until a lot of people would go through so you wouldn't have to tip the doorman. And, and then I'd, I raided the minibar for the three days I was in New York. But anyway, when I came back to San Francisco, I, I started this, this tour of uh, television shows. In those days, each city had its own different show. And um, it was, um, you know, you kind of, oh, I, I failed to mention that the sponsor for the trip was Stroh's Brewery. Do you guys remember Stroh's? Yeah. Good old Detroit brewery. And um, so they set up this PR thing, and I went on shows all over the country. And then I went on one in Detroit, and the show was called Kelly and Company. And it was like my 10th or 11th show, and I was pretty savvy at this point. And the three guests for my hour on the show were me. Joyce Brothers, do you remember her, the, the TV, and Richard Simmons. And uh, so I come out first, right, and I'm sitting back and telling them my stories of the Cape Horn trip. And the, the guy, the, the host, his name's John Kelly, he goes, you know, you're not making me feel what it was really like out there on the ocean. So I got up off the couch. I went over and I picked him up in his easy chair and I shook it up and down. I said, it was like that for 72 days. And... <laughs> This is big TV stuff, you know, all, all the middle-aged ladies in the audience shrieked, and I slid down the couch, and Joyce Brothers came out next. I kind of with her back to me, she says, you know, John, your first guest was very interesting, but I've invariably found these adventurer types are masking some form of sexual repression. 
And then it, the, the film shoots over and it says, John Kreshmer, adventurer. <laughs> anyway, then Richard Simmons comes out and he tossles my hair and he says, don't tell me you washed your hair in salt water for 72 days. And at the end of the, the, end of the show, Richard Simmons, Joyce Brothers and I are exercising and it's, Anyway, after that, I realized it was time to be something other than famous. <clears throat> but to what Ron alluded, the, um, the fact that we pulled that expedition off was really quite amazing because I was a very inexperienced sailor. And I uh, had dropped out of college four times. I was uh, kind of floundering a bit, um, but I had really made a study of sailing literature. The thing that really rocked my world was when my father died when I was 16. And uh, it triggered a lifelong mistrust or dislike of the whole notion of time. And then when my sister was diagnosed with cancer that she didn't survive at age 23, the whole idea was cemented in my head that it was kind of folly to place all your bets on the promise of tomorrow and discard the promise of today. And I really adapted and that idea that you should live for the moment and it became a real driving force in my life it's interesting when i look back at it because i wrote a lot about it in my latest book i i had this kind of weird philosophy where i embraced existentialism and stoicism and i filtered them all through different sailing books by the time i was 18 i'd literally read every sailing book that had ever been written and uh i i knew and my mom knew you know my mom was kind of patient with me and she uh she did give me that, that sort of grand bargain that Ron alluded to, but she also knew that the idea of sailing around the world or just sailing was my dream. And I think in a way that only mothers can know, she knew it would end up being my destiny. And it turned out to be that way. So I went from being famous to being a yacht delivery captain. And this was ostensibly the best gig I ever had. I just loved it. I delivered boats all over the world, racked up lots of miles on lots of different kinds of boats. And I was busy. In one year, I took three boats across the Atlantic and delivered one from Florida to Japan. Um, yeah, we, uh, on that Japan delivery, we encountered General Noriega's henchmen in the Panama Canal and Typhoon Roy. <laughs> I uh, delivered another boat from Sri Lanka up the Red Sea and uh, encountered a coup d'etat in Yemen. Um, lucky to survive that. Probably the craziest delivery I'd made was a 71-foot ocean from Newport, Rhode Island to Stockholm, Sweden. Nothing unusual about that, except that we left Newport in January and we sailed across the North Atlantic in the middle of the winter. We were in a gale for 10 consecutive days. But uh, with the arrival of my two daughters, I had to kind of change gears again. I had to have a more scheduled sailing life. And I wrote, let me see if I have these glasses here. I wrote in my book, Sailing a Serious Ocean, kind of what that change looked like for me. And it's a phrase that I really like. So when I wrote, I'm a ferryman, Neptune's lackey, nothing more and certainly nothing less. I never really fit into the so-called real world. So I went to sea. I studied at Harvard South, Cape Horn, and then did graduate work ferrying sailboats all over the world and telling stories afterwards. Today, I'm a connection between sailing dreamers and blue water. They're, I'm their conduit to the sea. They find me and we make passages, real passages. There's nothing virtual about what we do. I had come to realize that sailing with those who had not, left, who had not lost their sense of awe was what I was meant to do. And sharing hard-won opinions and shards of saltwater wisdom, all the while nurturing dreams of faraway places and fragile visions of personal freedom was what I did best. This is my job and it's a good gig. And it has been a good gig. I've been taking people to sea now for 20 years. I've had a thousand people come aboard my sailboat Quetzal. We've made amazing voyages. The people that sail with me, they rock the world when they're ashore. But at sea, we all feel very, very refreshingly small. If, uh, if you have any lacking in humility, you just need to make an ocean passage. <laughs> the ocean will, will definitely knock some humility into you. Um, it's interesting because one of the discoveries that I've made um, has really made my life better and it's made life aboard Quetzal just wonderful, is that the people that do come sailing with me, they have great 
experience ranges. Some are, have crossed oceans, others have barely sailed at all. But my discovery and my real role as a captain is the realization that everyone who's able to find the time, carve out the space, have the money, and most of all, have the wherewithal to want to make a passage like this is supremely talented. It sounds corny, and I used to poo-poo this whole leadership kind of stuff. But everybody who turns up is a, has been making wise, smart decisions most of their life, whether they can tie a knot or not. And my job as captain is to recognize what they're good at and to empower them and certainly not to sell them short and not to, not to lord over them. I think one of the most ridiculous things are sailboat captains who, who have this little sphere of knowledge about sailing then kind of hoard it. And, and mock you if you can't tie the right knot and insist you do something this way or that way. I learned something new from my crews on every trip. And uh, I'm apparently not much of a teacher because every, people tend to come back a lot. <laughs> they don't learn much on that first trip. But it's turned into a really wonderful thing we have where we, we launch voyages and we have shared experiences. Um, and 75% of the people sail with me time and again. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. But people always ask me, they say, come on, John, you, you make it sound so good. There must be people who've come aboard that you don't like. And I go, no, 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 it's not true. I, I love the, my customers. In fact, my customers have become my best friends in the world. They don't believe me and they push and they push. And I finally go, okay, there've been three. <laughs> <laughs> there was the Hungarian KGB agent. <laughs> she was a tough lady. Um, <laughs> And then there was this couple from the Midwest. So I have to go back in time just a little bit again. I, I had a period, I, Picasso had his blue period, I had my Mayan period. I was very involved in sailing in Central America and doing research and writing about the ancient Maya of Central America. We did a film for Sweden TV about Maya mariners and the Maya maritime heritage. And it was one of the coolest projects I've ever done. But like a lot of these so-called artistic and writing things, I never made any money at it. So I had to do what I always do. I had to make money by sailing. So I set up sailing trips just like I do now. Um, but they were unique. They were one week sails down in the Southern Belize and Guatemala. And what we did was we partnered with these small coastal Mayan villages who were wanting to cash in on the sort of the, tr the tourism boom of Belize and Mexico and Guatemala and Honduras, but they didn't want to sell their souls to the real estate developers. So we would sail to these guest houses they built and we would go ashore. Sometimes we'd spend the night ashore. We'd have dinner there. We'd go on jungle hikes with the shaman. We would wield adzes and help build dugout canoes. It was really a fun thing. So we'd spend three or four nights in kind of along the jungle coast doing these things and then we go out to the reef for a couple of nights and then that was the trip. So I sold berths just like I do on Quetzal. I mean, when you sign up for Quetzal, you have no idea where you're gonna sleep, no idea who your watchmate's gonna be. You just kinda come to the dock and hope for the best and it usually works out pretty well. Well, the last trip of this particular winter down in Belize, this couple from the Midwest booked the whole boat for themselves. Usually I would sell six berths. And I figured, wow, that's really cool. It would be easier for me, less cooking, less cleaning. And uh, I thought, wow, they must be really into the Mayas, you know, ardent Mayanist. So the way it worked was you'd fly to Belize City, take a taxi to the small local airport, then fly usually in a Cessna 182 down to Placencia, where I was based in southern Belize. I'd pick you up there and drive you out to uh, out to Sonny's hotel, where well, it was hotel, motel, was a little open air kind of shack on the beach, but super cool. And then that night we'd have dinner at Brenda's barbecue. And the next morning we'd move aboard the boat and go off sailing in search of the Maya. Well, Placencia was pretty much a black town. Um, there were some Maya scattered around, but mostly it was, there were a few expatriates like us, but primarily it was a Garifuna town. Um, and so anyway, the plane lands and kind of wheels to a stop. And the pilot gets out first, and he looks over at me, and he's kind of sweating. He says, man, Captain, they're all yours now, brother. And so my crew starts to disembark, and the husband is, honest to God, he's a good 400 pounds, and he plops out of the plane, and he's in a full safari suit with a pith helmet. And his wife is 
She's about 80 pounds and not looking all that happy to be in Placencia. So <laughs> we're, uh, anyway, so guy walks up to me and he says, you John Kretschmer? I said, yeah, John Kretschmer, great to meet you. He says, thank God you're white. This country's darker than a moonless night. The pilot who's a black guy looks at me and says, I told you, man. You know? So he's going black, black, black. Oh, oh my God, what an asshole, right? So I uh, don't know exactly what to do with him. So I get him into, I borrow Sonny's pickup truck to pick him up. Sonny, of course, is a black guy. And, um, and I never knew whether Sonny's pickup truck would make the two miles to the runway and back but it was kind of rocky and rickety. Anyway, I get them in there and I'm thinking, all right, well, this probably isn't going to work well having them stay at Sonny's and go to Brenda's barbecue. <laughs> so I say, you know, we're going to alter plans a little bit here. We're just going to put you guys right on the boat. So in those days, Placencia was really rough and ready and I loved it that way. The, and Fortuna, my steel boat was tied up at the end of a real rickety dock. And, uh, so every third or fourth plank was missing and they tipped up. You know, you've seen these docks, right? So I grabbed these massive bags of theirs. I told them to travel light. And as we're walking down the dock, I'm saying, be careful, watch that plank, be careful, be careful. And sure enough, the wife falls right between two planks down in the water. <laughs> so the husband goes, oh, look at that, she fell right through. <laughs> Holy crap, so I dive overboard, right? <laughs> grab her and I get her back to the beach and I'm really sorry, you know, and, and we start walking. So you guys don't have to come. She goes, oh, no, no, he really wants to do it. Oh, my God. So we get to the end of the dock and I'm thinking I'm going to need the halyard to get him on board. And uh, he just kind of crashes aboard and she gets aboard. So I jump on. I get the hydrogen peroxide out for her because she's all scraped up. And the husband had told me when I got her back, I said, you know, she's really hurt. She goes, ah, she's fine. She'll scab right over. <laughs> so, the, uh, the, anyway, so get them aboard and I dig out the charts and pour them a stiff rum and um, the guy says to me, and I give him all these articles I've written about the Maya and he says, you know, John, we don't really give a damn about the Maya. He goes, Mayan Shmayan, seen one Indian, seen them all. I'm like, God, this guy's a complete idiot. Eh? And he goes, yeah, they're past their prime anyway. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I finally, I said to him, man, what are you doing here? Honestly, at that point, if I hadn't already spent their money, I would have happily refunded it. But <laughs> I said, yeah, this is what the whole thing's about. And he goes, yeah, we just want to go sailing. You know, we're not really culture people. And I said, well, I've already paid these Mayan villages. You know, they're expecting us. He goes, tell me how much. He goes, cash cures everything. I, at this point, I'm ready to crack the guy, and you know, and he finally settles back a little bit. I said, "This is crazy." He goes, "You know, the reason we charted with you is you're the only boat in Belize doing this." So we kind of came to a little peace. I said, "All right, well, you guys bed down here for the night," and I had a place ashore, and I went scrambling around looking for provisions because I was all set up for them to eat in all the guest houses, and all I could find was a Chinese grocery store. And the only thing they had in it were they, that I thought these people might like were, oh, were, were spaghetti noodles and ragu and old ancient cans of corned beef. So <laughs> I loaded this aboard, hoping that we sailed out to the reef. We'd meet my friend, these conch divers that I knew, and I'd be able to buy fresh fish. So we sail out to the reef and no conch divers in sight. So we anchor. And, you know, it's interesting thing about sailing is the poetry of a perfect sailing day can smooth over even the biggest jerks in the world. We actually had a nice day. And I decided at this point I was going to toy with them a little bit. So I said, not to worry. I'm going to make you guys a special dinner tonight. I said, I know you're not interested in the Maya, but we made an amazing discovery in all of our research. Marco Polo had it wrong. It wasn't the Chinese who invented spaghetti. It was the Mayans. <laughs> and more than that, we actually found on these stone stelae, these, these, these you know, pyramids in the jungle, uh, hieroglyphs of Mayan warlords having spaghetti feasts. And the, guy, the guy's going, really, you don't say? And I said, oh yeah, yeah. And amazingly, we interpreted the glyphs and got the recipe. He's going, you shitting me? I said, no, no, you got to swear to secrecy though. He goes, well, I will, I got any more rum top this glass. And, so I'm down below cooking up this schlock of ragu and corned beef. 
and I'm making it look like something, and I serve it up to them, and they love it. They absolutely love it. And we had Mayan spaghetti the whole rest of the trip. <laughs> uh, anyway, the thing about sailing for me is that sailing and riding have always been joined at the hip. I, I always viewed them as a, as a co-task. I remember telling my 10th grade career advisor that I wanted to have sailing adventures and write books about it. And she kind of rolled her eyes and said, oh, my God, and hoped that her daughter never met me, I think. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, but I have been able to uh, write a lot of books now, as it turns out. This is my seventh book, the fifth actual narrative style book. And two, of my, two books of my columns have been combined. And all humility aside, I've been kind of astonished. They've sold well over 100,000 copies. I've sold film rights to some of them. Um, They've won some awards, and um, it's been a surprise to me that I've been able to do this. Um, interestingly enough, one of my early, one of my high school English teachers came on one of my passages a few years ago, and he told the crew, he said, you know, I thought there was a really small chance that John might end up being an Olympic pole vaulter, but no shot he'd ever write a book. <laughs> <laughs> But I've always been lucky. It's sort of been a good, good character trait of mine. And I had a lot of help when I started writing, too. And when my book, Flirting with Mermaids, came out, which is a book about all these yacht delivery stories, I, um, I had a, one of the guys mentioned in the books, this wonderful fellow named Dan Sullivan. And he just passed away last year. And he's mentioned in the book. And he wanted to help me get the book out there. He felt a debt to me because I had saved his life when he had a heart attack on the boat and we managed to get the boat back to port and get him off the boat and to Yale Medical Clinic. And it was a miracle he survived. And that story is in my latest book. But in this book that he's mentioned is because he came on one of the deliveries with me. And um, he was a real successful guy in Boston. He had a high tech company and had been married a few times. He was one of those Boston Irishmen with a glint in his eye and just a really charming, wonderful guy. Anyway, so he ordered 50 copies from the publisher to kind of spearhead the, the book when it came out. And he sent, me a, he sent me the books to my house and sent a list of how I was supposed to inscribe them all. And on some of them, like to his old girlfriends, I was supposed to write, you know, is it true Dan Sullivan's the world's greatest lover? And... <laughs> He was engaged to a lovely lady who we're friends, dear friends with today. And I wrote one to, you know, his future mother-in-law. His best friend is this guy named Jim Meehan, and his nickname is Shit for Brains. And so on that one, I wrote, hey, Shit for Brains, Dan Sullivan doesn't know whether you can read or not. But if you, if you can find page 167, you'll see the words Dan Sullivan. Anyway, so, oh, I'm running fast. I'm going fast, Ron. So he... Uh, so anyway, I shipped them all back to, to Boston, and Dan takes the box of books down to his shipping department, and he puts the address where each one's supposed to go and says, ship these out. So the shipping guy realizes they're all the same book, so he pulls all the addresses out, and the books go out randomly. <laughs> so his new mother-in-law-to-be gets, hey, shit for brains. <laughs> <laughs> and the poor guy was on damage control <laughs> for months after that. One last, one last writing story here real quick. So, you know, writers don't really make any money today, but you do occasionally have some notoriety. We were sailing in Newfoundland a few years ago, and um, I'd been there five years before, and when I sailed back into the same port, the dock master came running out. He said, John, John, you know, great to see you, as though like, I'd been there yesterday. He goes, you know, you were here five years ago. I said, yeah, I know, Jerry. He goes, give me a beer. I got a story for you. So he plops down in the cockpit. He says, you know, you were here, right, five years ago. I said, yeah, I know. He goes, well, after, you know, after we talked, I went home and I told the wife, I said, there's a writer from the States in the, in the harbor. And she goes, oh, really, what's his name? And I said, John. And she goes, not his first name, you moron. What's his last name? He goes, I don't know, Gretchen, Gretchen, Gretchen. She goes, Gretchen? John Grisham is in the harbor? He goes, yeah, yeah, that's it, Grisham. So his wife calls all of her friends, and they collect all their John Grisham books, and they come down to the harbor at 9 o'clock the next morning. But John Grisham had sailed away at 8 o'clock, fortunately, so I didn't have to sign their books. 
And here's my concluding story. So the last thing writers do these days is they hog Google. They don't, they don't make any money anymore. They're not famous like they used to. But if you Google a writer's name, they hog it. So a guy emails me a few years ago, and he says, my name's John Kretschmer. And he says, this is bullshit. You hog Google. And it turns out that he's a big-time TV guy. He's an Emmy Award-winning set designer and a director, and he's worked on Homeland and many other shows. And he says, since I can't beat you, I'm going to join you. So he orders a John Kretschmer sailing T-shirt. So just last year, he's in Amman, Jordan, and he's scouting out sites and uh, you know places where they're going to shoot the last season of Homeland. And um, the Jordanians are treating them really well. And he goes up into his hotel room to, uh, you know, after a day, and on his nightstand are copies of Sailing a Serious Ocean, At the Mercy of the Sea, Flirting with Mermaids. <laughs> and he writes me an email saying, screw you. <laughs> anyway, everybody, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah, you're right. We got a video to play here. So there we go. So this is the cover of my new book, which, by the way, is for sale here. <laughs> that's the selling bell. Um, that's Quetzal, our boat. She doesn't look like that anymore. We have de-teaked her. But uh, I bought the boat in 2003, and in the, we've never sailed her less than 8,000 miles since then. Um, she's made eight Atlantic crossings, and she just keeps moving all the time. Um, She's been a, just been a great boat. You know, my theory in life is that with a good boat, anything's possible. And that's approaching Pico in the Azores. This is a typical crew after one of my heavy weather passages. I am lucky. I have customers and friends now from all over the world. Sean and yo are from Hong Kong. About half my business is from abroad. This is uh, sailing not on our boat, but in Scotland last summer. And we are... Uh, Every now and then we organize charter passages when we want to give Quetzal a break or Quetzal's far away. But uh, we are really pretty lucky. We've sailed all over the world. You know, it's interesting. Celestial navigation is still alive and well. That was a young skipper with a lot of hair. That's an old skipper with a lot without much hair, but still a sexton. So my stick probably is that we take people on real passages that often include heavy weather. Um, I've been in a lot of storms. I know I seem smarter than that. That was getting ready for that crossing to Sweden. That 71 foot boat not only was huge, but it had Hank on sails. <clears throat> but I think one of the reasons why we have success with our voyages is that we, we treat them as adventures. We take them super seriously, but we don't go in the bunker. We listen to the opera, we make great food. This is just a nice, pleasant 30 knots in the Atlantic on a crossing a few years ago. <laughs> and I think the attitude that you bring to these passages has a lot to do with how successful they are. <laughs> I forgot this was in here still. But I used to rule my world from a payphone, as Jimmy Buffett once wrote, doing deliveries all over the world. I got into a lot of trouble, sailed into that coup, had some pretty serious repairs to do, but I usually managed to get out of it. And this was our great Cape Horn expedition. That was Gigi sailing under the Brooklyn Bridge. And this is pretty interesting footage. I didn't tell you, but we were capsized early on in that passage, and I was pitched overboard. Um, 30 seconds of uh, absolute terror. And it's funny how those seconds have really stayed with me. This was from a, a PBS uh, documentary. And the graphics are going to blow you away here in a minute. That's the wind speed indicator hitting 50 knots. But this is <laughs> this high-tech graphics. This is the, <laughs> the wave that overwhelmed us. You know, the, the moments in the water have stayed with me, and neurologists call that slow motion perception. You, they have kind of an outsized part of your memory. Sailors just call it sea stories. <laughs> but that was a tough night. But this is, uh, this is really cool footage. This is what Taji posted on Instagram. Um, this is actually us rounding Cape Horn. 
And when we did this, I make light of it, but we were the first American sailors to ever double Cape Horn in a yacht, meaning sail from 50 south in the Atlantic to 50 south in the Pacific. And we were never really sure, but we feel like in Lynn Party, and I have chatted about it, that Gigi, our little boat, was the smallest boat to ever do that, which is kind of cool. <laughs> I was 24 years old. I was 23 years old then. And I think back, I mean, we had no right to be there. We just, we just kept sailing south until Cape Horn turned up. <clears throat> but you'll see when we round the horn here, sort of an epic Southern Ocean gale we survived. Yeah, that's Cabo de Hornos. So we're headed back there in Quetzal in 2021. Little spoiler alert. This is when we got around the horn. You know, when you round the horn, it's only even going to windward around the horn. The real work begins in the Southern Ocean where you have to claw your way off the, the lee shore of Chile. This was just typical going, but that showed our route doubling the horn. And after we got past the 50th parallel in the Pacific, we encountered an enormous storm. Um, we're just flying under staysail alone. You can see how long these waves break for. They were 20, 30 foot waves. And this was a boat with 28 inches of freeboard. There were times Gigi would be picked up in the wave and I'm not joshing, you'd see fish higher than we were in the waves. <laughs> and you just kind of wait and you'd shoot down the wave. You were never really sure you were still on top of the world until you came out the other side. But that's us sailing into San Francisco when we came into Pier 39. So I was lucky. 32 years after rounding the horn to sail Gigi again in Scotland. The owner uh, had restored her. But as I mentioned, I've done a lot of historical voyages. We sailed in the route of Sinbad the Sailor. We tracked him in, in India and in Oman. That's a dhow we sailed on in Mumbai. Um, and, but it was when I sailed with the Belize fishermen on these classic Belize sloops that I started to learn about the, the maritime heritage of the Maya. And this was our old rusty steel bow Fortuna, kind of our research boat. She only rusted when she got wet. <laughs> <laughs> and we built this dugout canoe with some university students and it actually floated for a few minutes to allow us to get this picture. <laughs> These were my friends, the conch divers, uh, Raymundo. And this is a uh, Stella in the jungle. And if you'll notice carefully, you'll see the Mayans having a spaghetti feast there. <laughs> and we've sailed to the far north, which we really love. That's an iceberg off Labrador. Uh, it's quite a sight to see. And we actually chiseled some ice off of it. Um, and this is John Kretschmer's room in, in Jordan with all my books on it. But life aboard Quetzal is a good life. We, uh, we really have fun. We make voyages. You can see now we've added a hard top. And uh, Taji and I have big plans for the future. We're setting off on a round the world trip starting in 2021. Um, so start in the Arctic and go by way of Cape Horn again. So what I'm going to show you now is just a very little, a nice little video, two minute movie of what one of our training passages looks like. This is sailing from Cadiz, Spain to the Canary Islands. The crew range from age 77 to 31. They're pretty breezy when we left out of Spain. We knew the winds were going to be brisk, and we ended up having a gale that we hove to in for a few hours. We always eat good food on Quetzal. We never slap up sandwiches.
most times I feel just like So that device on the back is a hydrovane steering vane. It's a fantastic contraption. Wind's really filled in, and we're sailing with just the head sail pulled out, making eight or nine knots. Katsal's like an old swan. She's got that same hull shape, really an easily driven, but stout boat when it blows. But everybody works. It's not a pleasure cruise. One of the world's slowest sail changes. <laughs> Landfall looms, Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Anyway, thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah. yeah. All right. Perfect. So uh, we have some announcements to make. So why don't I ask our Commodore, Ken Glidewell, to come on up and give us some news. St. Francis members in the news. Kenny. Thanks, Ron. And, and thanks, John. I'm so excited to meet John Grisham, finally. Um, a couple of quick notes. Last week, uh, I don't know if, if you guys have been following the news, but uh, a member, Daniel Morose, won the Yachts Woman of the Year, the Rolex Yachts Woman of the Year. So I think that's uh, worth sharing with all of you. And then Michael Martin and Adam Lowry also won the Rolex Yachtsman of the Year. That was all last week. So that would be a clean sweep? A, a complete clean sweep. And then last You're night, yeah, thanks, Jim. And then last night, um, Paul Kayard was inducted into, well, will be inducted into, but was announced that he'll be the, in the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame. So that was announced last night at 5 o'clock. So <clears throat> I want to make sure everyone here is aware of that because it's, uh, it's quite an accomplishment for our members, and uh, we want to make sure we recognize all of them. So thank you. Thank you, Commodore. Thanks, Kenny. So, um, John, in this all this time, you've sailed 300,000 miles. How many miles? 300,000. How many wives? <laughs> no comment. Just two. Yeah. Two. How I have about, an amazing wife at the moment. Yeah. How about kids? How many kids? So I have two daughters, and Taji has two sons. So that really did sort of shift the direction of our sailing because we had to kind of be – Taji was a teacher for 20 years. And um, then uh, the girls spent a lot of their young life on the boat for sure. In fact, I had them so brainwashed that <laughs> when we'd walk to school or whatever, if they'd see some kid misbehaving, they'd go, oh, it's a land kid. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us the scariest moment, a scariest moment. Uh, one of the really scary moments that's in my book, Sailing a Serious Ocean, was when we, we got pooped, uh, just completely washed over by a wave. And one of my crew members, Deanne, was swept by the wave and virtually washed off the boat. And she hung up on the stern rail by her, bat, by the, by her knees. And we really struggled to get her aboard. But when we managed to do that, but that was terrifying because I was, it unfolded slowly. It was much more frightening for me then than when I was actually in the water wondering what I was going to do if she, if she went over. And I realized just how these things hang by the smallest of things. And if the lifeline, that little silly shackle we use on those, if that had parted, I think she would have washed overboard. Where was this? This was on a passage from Nova Scotia to Fort Lauderdale in November. It's one of the crazy things we do around is we have heavy weather trips. And when well, we that's a long passage. From where where on the passage did this happen? It happened right yeah, good question. It happened right as we entered the Gulf Stream. And in fact it was really stupid skippering on my part because I had aimed for 
what I knew would be a very narrow section of the Gulf Stream to kind of get that crossing over with because it was going to be a collision of wind and wave. But I should have aimed for a broader section because that narrow section is where the current was most accelerated. So it was a really vicious stretch of ocean. What was wind angle? So the wind angle was changing fast. It had gone from, we were sailing south-southwest. The wind was due north, but it was basically clocking to the northeast. So a northeast wind collides directly with the Gulf Stream. So we were kind of in this race to get across before it really stirred up and we didn't quite make it. So what's your favorite point of sail in really stormy conditions? If it gets scary, what do you want to do? That's a really good question. It's something I write a lot about, but my strategy works like this, um, is to stay engaged with the storm as long as you can. And in our boat, Kitsall, which is a 47 foot, 30,000 pound boat with a moderate fin keel, we heave to really nicely in 30, 40 knots of wind. Um, we can just turn the world off. Boat stays about 60 degrees off the wind, that's great. When conditions deteriorate beyond that, depends on the crew. Running off is dangerous and exhausting. So a really good strategy, it's what ocean racers have always done, is just a foreach, where you just essentially under control with small sails slog along into the seas. So a close reach. Basically a close, close reach. reach. Yeah. So what's your sail plan in the current boat for that? So I'm well set up for it. So our staysail doubles as a storm jib. Um, and it actually has a conventional furling part to it. I can drop it down and it turns into a 60 square foot storm jib, triple reef main. Um, and the key thing that I've observed over the years is that the wind and the waves don't line up. So there's almost always a favored tack. And if you can find a tack, so you can be 60 to 55, 60 degrees off on one tack that's dramatically better than the other. So you find some way to be in harmony with the wave. Absolutely. And the, the, another good thing about forereaching as opposed to heaving to or running off is that you choose an angle that's typically taking you away from the storm. And so even if it's, if it's 24 hours of you going at four knots and the storm going at you know, five knots, you've put a lot of distance between you and the storm. You're getting out of it. Yeah. And so how fast is the boat going in those kind of circumstances? through the water it depends a lot on the interaction with the waves whether yeah. you're getting crammed or not but typically three and a half four knots you don't want a lot more speed than that because it really loads up everything and yet you need enough speed for the for the steering to work one of the problems with heaving too is that you you have to load your rudder fully um, and so there's a lot of load on the rudder so usually for me I can tell when it's time to stop that because the rudder is talking to me the beauty of this for reaching is that the rudder's lined up more or less behind the keel. It's right where it wants to. It's the way every boat wants to sail. Oh, it's balanced. Up exactly, the and it's easy, no loading on the rudder. I'm really rudder aware. <laughs> so tell us a pirate story. <laughs> well, we were sailing a few years ago from the Galapagos back to Panama, and we encountered, um, we were about 200 miles from Galapagos and maybe 200 miles off the coast of Ecuador. When we, uh, a skiff from a fishing boat approached us in the dark with five kind of, uh, you know, scruffy looking guys. Of course, and when I wrote that, I realized, God, I've been scruffy looking my entire life. But um, <laughs> and, uh, we had kind of a weird exchange and I had the owner of the boat with me on that. It wasn't Quetzal. And, he, and I basically was able to rebuff them by kind of threatening them, being nice at the same time, and they ended up pulling away. And the owner of the boat and I had a real furious exchange after, and he's a dear friend and a wonderful man, because I had made him take his guns off the boat for two reasons. One is I'm not a gun person, and also you can't get into the Galapagos if you have guns. Um, and so he had said, you know, that's what we needed the guns for. And I was saying, Paul, you're out of your mind. That situation couldn't have worked better if we'd brought out a weapon, everything would have escalated. You know, we were in that coup in Yemen and that was terrifying. That wasn't really a pirate story. We were, we'd inadvertently anchored in the, right in the middle of a civil war. <laughs> and uh, we were really lucky. We were the only boat to escape. Um, 10 other yachts that were in the inner harbor had to be abandoned. Uh, and they, it's, it's, it's a long story, but there's a great sailor. His name Trevor Robertson. He's a blue water medal winner. He's the only guy to ever sail to ever winter over in the Atlantic, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And I just met him again in the Caribbean this just a few weeks ago. And um, he was one of the guys who had to abandon his boat. 
So we sailed to Djibouti, and these guys that were rescued by a Russian ship were dropped off in Djibouti, and Trevor stayed with us. And he wanted to get back to his boat, which was called Salvation Jane. And he hired a local guy to take him back into the war zone, bought his crappy old dinghy from him, and in the dark of night, rode the dinghy in, got on Salvation Jane, and sailed it out of there. <laughs> now, I'm going to keep asking questions, but I want your questions, too. So if you have a question, hold your hand up, and we will bring the mic to you. And so I'd love to have questions from the audience. So talk about, describe a great crew person in generic terms. Who's a great crew that you have on board? What would a great crew do and be like? Well, engineers make great crew. Because <laughs> all you have to do is say, man, I bet there's no way we could fix this. <laughs> <laughs> and they are all over it. Um, the, uh, a great crew is someone who, is, you know, it's funny. Almost everybody is. It's your, your courteous, your, I'm really less concerned about your great sailing skills more than your human skills. Um, because the human relationships really come under a magnifier on a, in a small boat on a big ocean. Um, and so, you know, if you have a good supply of jokes, that helps. Um, good stories. But generally, just being a good human being and appreciating. One of the great things about the people that sail with me is that they're at a stage in their life where they realize that these days are magical. You know, that big guy, so I have the CEO of Husqvarna has been with me a few times. He has no desire to get satellite email. He has no desire to communicate at all. He recognizes that this is a little oasis away from the madness. <laughs> Speaking of great guys, do we have a question over here? Jimmy DeWitt, Mallory Cup winner, famous artist, Jimmy. Uh, I have two things. A friend of mine was off some island in Mexico or Baja. Um, and they didn't have any guns on board. And some cruddy looking guys came out from Mexico and they knew that they were up to no good. He didn't have a gun. He took a flare gun and shot it in the water right next to him and they took off. Yeah. The other thing it was that you have all these people, land lovers coming on board. I've spent a lot of time out in the ocean, but I still get seasick. How about seasick? What happened to these people? Good questions. If I was king of the world, I would forget about world peace, but I would eliminate seasickness. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the curse of the world. Um, many, many people suffer from it. And people try various things. My observation is most people get over it after a few days. Um, and... Um, yeah, so it, that's a drag, and you just it's, you just sort of deal with it. And people tend to push their way through it, which is impressive to me. Um, as far as the flare gun goes, yeah, I mean, there's that's just it. There are lots of ways to defend yourself. I've got this slingshot, <laughs> and it's funny. I used to be so good at it, but now I can't hit the broadside of a barn, so the pirates are safer. And Ta Taji always jokes, my only hope is when they come aboard with their weapons, they start laughing at me with my slingshot. <laughs> so I have time to get them. <laughs> What's the meal plan? What do people eat? So, it's, so I, I mean, I always joke about it, but the meal plan, we eat good, healthy food. We eat three meals a day. And one of the things we do is we have captain's hour. And this is controversial because I'm not a teetotaler, and I think having a drink aboard actually sometimes helps people sleep. The keys to seasickness, in my view, are, and the keys to feeling good on a boat, are they have to eat. You have to, you know, you have to sleep and you have to get your body happy. You have to get regular. And if you sort of shut off all the things you do on land and go into this new rarefied state, it doesn't help you feel any better. So I tend to make, you know, three meals a day. I'm the cook um, by design because for three reasons. For one, I know how much food's aboard. And whenever I have, I have some great cooks aboard, but they use half the provisions on one meal. Um, Two is that I'm not prone to seasickness, so I can produce a meal anytime. And three is it gives me a little time to myself. So, yeah, I mean, we'll have meats, fishes, but it's all healthy food. Um, 
One of the, you know, the great thing about Captain's Hour, one of my crew on the last trip of What time us, is Captain's Hour? Five o'clock. <laughs> um, and you either drink or you don't. I mean, and no, you know, you have one glass of wine or one drink. No one's ever abused it. That's the beauty of it over the years. But we play this game where we have hypothetical questions. Um, and the hypothetical might be you're stranded on a desert island. You only get three books. What three would they be? And I never really thought that it was anything more than just fun, but Mark was saying he loved this because it's kind of an equalizer. It, it sort of makes everybody's dream as important as the next guy's, and these hypothetical questions kind of pull us together as a crew. So the whole Captain's Hour thing is a bit of a bonding experience, and you know, I'm making it sound kind of kumbaya here, but it's, it's really fun, and we, we yuck it up a lot. Another question. Uh, John, you said you're very rudder aware. Mm. 300,000 miles, have you ever lost a rudder? And if so, what'd you do? So that's a really good question. I have not. And, but I have um, been, have had a rudder disabled and realized how crazy that is. On that Japan delivery, we were maybe 1,000 miles from Hawaii when the steering chain broke rendering the helm useless. And we rigged up the emergency tiller and realized that was a complete joke. You actually steered from in the aft cabin. Um, so we spent a day just kind of reconfiguring a, a steering chain. But Jimmy Cornell states in his book that 75% of ships abandoned, yachts abandoned at sea are not because of collision or fire or whatever, but because of rudder failure. Once the rudder is out of whack, you're really at the mercy of the sea. So. I, it's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of drogues and sea anchors. And if you guys have used them, but when you see all that crap in the water and you have to really position it properly when a, when a wave comes up, because all of the gear of the sea anchor particularly kind of comes right up to the boat and then drops back again. You don't just lay there perfectly unless you're kind of lucky. And all of that stuff working its way around the rudder is serious. So I've added that hydrovane, um, and it's, a, it's a, a steering vane that has its own independent rudder. It doesn't steer as well as like a monitor maybe, but close. But the beauty of it is, is it's a complete independent steering system. It's a really fantastic product. I would strongly recommend it to anyone making an offshore passage. Because if you were to lose your rudder, you literally, the hydrovane can steer the boat. <clears throat> Jim Lucier has a question. Jimmy. Yeah, so obviously the weather is one of the most important things you've got to be looking out for what do you use what services what software what systems what senses do you use you know, you know it's funny to, that's to, uh, to figure out what's, what's coming and all that in in my sailing career the three big changes have been furling gear which really didn't exist much the second was gps which rocked the world and the third is reliable weather information and it, the ability to get it easily offshore. So I have a little leg up on everybody because um, I, I use Oceans, O-C-E-N-S, and my Iridium Go, and we download grid files once or twice a day, and it's super easy to do, um, very, very easy. But there's sort of been a, um, a new business sprout up about weather routers, and, and I'm ambivalent toward that because I think that weather routers oftentimes don't understand the philosophy of how you sail or how you want to sail. And as silly as this sounds, you just hiring somebody and think, oh, I'm good now. It's critical that you tell them, look, hey, my boat's better on Port Tech than Starboard. We prefer to four reach. You have to build a relationship. So I have my brother-in-law, like I said, I was lucky, is a fantastic sailor. Um, and he also owns a marina in Maryland, which has been super helpful to me in life. But he is a two-time circumnavigator, and he and I email every day. And what he can do is look at lots of different sites on land and give me his opinion on it. You know, Trevor and I are of the same mind that every decision ultimately is the skipper's. But the weather information today is amazing. And interestingly enough about grip files is that they're more accurate out at sea than they are anywhere else because they're less influenced by land and things to change them. So a three, four, even five day downloaded grip file today is remarkably good. And, you know, I was one of those guys who prided myself on my weather knowledge and smelling the weather. And, you know, I could 
and, and, and like a lot of weather experts, they poo poo this simplified grid file format, but it's just changed the game remarkably. The weather is definitely less predictable today than ever before, but our knowledge of it is so much better that you can manage. <laughs> So what is your email or phone service ship to shore? How do you stay in touch? Okay, so same system that we use for weather. So Iridium makes this little hotspot. Um, it looks like a hockey puck, basically, and you have an external antenna, and you talk to it through your computer or your iPad or your phone. You get a signal, and it looks just like your cell phone. And, you, and I can send texts or emails basically all day long. We, it's kind of disgusting, really, in a way. We are connected all the time. Um, voice is still expensive, and we don't use voice very often, but we are able to, the crews are able to send an email or a text basically several times a day if they want to. So anybody has questions, put your hand up and we'll bring the mic. So you're busy sailing the boat. What about your writing process? What is your process? Desperation. Deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> Threats of having to pay back the advance. So typical writing, <laughs> typical writing process. Then. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, you know, I write do you in, do the, in the morning, do you in the afternoon, you do it when you're off watch. What are you doing? I can't seem to write underway. Um, mm -hmm. So I write when we're someplace. Um, uh, yeah, I write in the aft cabin. One of the cool things we do is we organize other sailing trips, and Taji's amazing at finding really cool places to stay. And I wrote Sailing to the Edge of Time in Paris, in Greece, in Venice, and these were all weak interludes in between passages we'd organize. But it's hard. Writing is hard work, and um, I'm brutally slow at it. <laughs> so what's the, what kind of watch system do you use when you're underway? Depends on the crew size, but the, the watch system for us is the one thing on the boat that is carved in stone. I mean, you have to essentially be dead not to turn up for your watch. And we typically, if there are a typical watch, a crew size on Quetzal will be six. And so we have two person watches, three on, six hours off. The thing that we do that makes it work well. Did you say three on, six off? Three yeah. on, six off? Okay. So we rotate it though. Yeah. So let's say the watch is eight to 11, 11 to two, two to five. If you're the 8 to 11 tonight, you and your partner will be the 11 to 2 the next night. And so people tend to make their whole day activity work around their watch schedule. If they're the 8 to 11 watch, a lot of times they'll skip having a drink at captain's hour. If they're the 2 to 5, they'll have one or they'll work on celestial navigation. So the rotating of the watch frees people up to kind of plan their days differently. Another question from the audience. I was wondering, it sounds like you're always on the water. Do you have a home on land? <laughs> uh, no, we did until very recently. We just sold our house. So for years, we, I had this dual life of charging off, doing trips, leaving the boat someplace, coming back. And, you know, the kids are in school. Um, Taji was a teacher. But now we are completely homeless, and the boat is home, which – it's good and bad. It's no, it's fun. I mean, I'm, I, I never, every time I paid that mortgage, I thought, my God, all this money in this thing stays in one place. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question from the audience. Uh, sailing a serious ocean gives the impression that in the middle of every storm, you're writing in your journal. How do you do that? Grief. Um, I have a good memory, and um, you know, I I keep pretty good notes underway. You know, that your journal and the ship's log is kind of a, a place where you, uh, if you, I still subscribe to that theory. And that you know, as a as a professional skipper, the the law the log is an actual legal record of the voyage. So we try to make keep that filled. Um, you know, all joking aside, I, I do, and it's not as good as it was, have a great memory. And the nice thing about the way I write my stuff now is I'll often, after and when I'm ready to write the story or whatever, I'll send letters out to everybody who was aboard and get their input on it. And that's a really nice way to write, so it doesn't just have to all be my perspective. Yeah. So talk about the differences between the oceans. That's an interesting question. Um, so the Pacific is 
it just two years ago we sailed from Hawaii to Seattle. Um, you know, we've sailed to Japan, done a lot of Pacific sailing. The the Atlantic's been my office. <laughs> I mean, it's been my commute basically. I've made twenty seven Atlantic crossings and um the Pacific is a little more pleasurable. I mean, sort of the cliches about it tend to be true. The ocean swell is longer. Um, you feel like you can stretch your wings out a little bit, and the weather patterns take a little longer to develop. The Atlantic is an easier ocean to sail in some ways because it's more compact, but it's a little bit friskier. Um, and the Indian Ocean is absolutely seasonal. And, you know, the thing about it, so my mom, is who I really admire. My mom is an amazing lady. She had seven children. I was the sixth. Um, she joined the Peace Corps after my father died and won the Lillian Carter Award. But what she did was really amazing. Is when she was 60, she and a student of mine who set off and sailed around the world in their Jeannot 38. And, Your mom? Uh, my mom, yeah. And uh, she and Tim, as far as I can tell, never really got a weather report. But they did something then that, really made their sailing safe is that they tended to sail the right time of year in the right ocean. They were patient. You basically left from Panama in March. You know, you cross the Indian Ocean starting in April. And so the the idea of like the Indian Ocean is so seasonal, but if you time it right seasonally and you don't rush the monsoons, you can generally be just fine. So I think where the Atlantic and Pacific, you can kind of push the envelope. The Indian is really a seasonal ocean. What about the Southern Ocean? Well, the Southern Ocean is it's, you know, a good friend of mine coined the phrase um, that it's the last great wilderness in the world. It's, uh, yeah, it's a pretty raw and rugged place. The, um, I think the thing about the Southern Ocean that I remember most is just the realization that you're on your own. It's a long way from any place. And it's a huge appeal to me. I know it's, I don't want it to sound like some kind of macho bullshit or whatever, but the notion of self-reliance and that this is a, 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 an adventure of my own choosing and I have to work my way through it is a big part of why I love this whole life. And you really feel that way down there. <laughs> so yeah. tell us a story about uh, a brilliant crew person. Um, let's see. I have a lot of really brilliant crew people. Um, I have a, I have a really good friend. His name is Ron Sorensen. He's a Norwegian guy. Um, he's done three Atlanta crossings with me and he now he's so vested in the boat that he literally spends part of his summer just coming up and working on it on his own dime which is, yeah, it's always a little tricky to explain to his wife why he's doing this. So but I can see why the owner would think of him as brilliant. <laughs> he's a, but he's just a real thoughtful, gentle guy. And we had a real big storm in the Atlantic one year. And the staysail, we were running for reaching with just the staysail up, and the staysail stay parted. So suddenly, in that day, I had a furling staysail, which I don't know. He had the furling drum, the stay just flying around, crashing into the boat. And one other crew member and I went up and grabbed it. And then we were starting to be lifted up and Ron grabbed us. And I'm screaming at Ron to let the hell you're down so we can at least get the sail down. And I'm going, the red one, the red one. And I guess I'm in sort of frantic and, and he knows it's the green one. And finally he says, John, I'm going to let the green one down. Because <laughs> <laughs> I want to drop the stays <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Just a real gentleman, too, and through. <laughs> Jimmy Lucy, you has a question. Jimmy. Yes. Uh, so have, have you ever been in a situation where you're taking on water, a lot of water, <laughs> and the boat is in danger of sinking? And related to that, have you ever had to abandon ship into a life raft? And, spend, and what's life in a life raft like <laughs> if you have? So the answer to the second part is no. I have never, but one thing we have done that's really unique and maybe unique among sailors is I run these workshops and we actually do, we take Quetzal out to the ocean and we launch the life raft and we, people get in it, not in a pool, not in a classroom. And you realize something really quickly is you never want to be in that life raft. <laughs> that's a really bad name for some. The life raft should be called the absolute last vessel of misery that I never want to get into under any condition. 
to your first point, yeah, I had a Hylus 49 come within an eyelash of sink out from under me. And it was, the water was above the countertops by the time I found the leak, which was just a stupid second depth sounder that had been added to the boat that nobody knew about. And the, and it was, the transducer cap was just lightly on there and it popped out in a Gulf Stream. Oh my God. And it would have been really easy to abandon ship, but I just couldn't believe because there was no collision, there was no reason. I, mean, I just knew it had to be something stupid. And finally, when there was enough water in the boat that all the drawers floated out, all the seat cushions were floating, I saw where the leak was. Yeah. You said examples of living in the moment. Give me an example of living in the moment. So one of the things that I have really come to change the way I sail is that I steer my boat a lot now. So it's really easy to have the autopilot drive the boat, but I have this communion with my boat virtually every time I'm on it, where I feel the waves, I feel the steering, I watch the ocean, I don't listen to music. You know, I'm a voracious reader, but I don't read on watch anymore. I'm just kind of realizing that this moment is really valuable to me. And as I get older, I find that my ears are as valuable as my eyes. You know, I, I literally, it's like, I swear that some of the, the great mammals come by more than they used to. And they go, Jesus Christ, John, you're still out here. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> they wife, hear whales. And, yeah, I, I, I'm very much aware of my environment. And I think it's a sign of old age, but it's, uh, it's nice. <laughs> well, John Kritschmer, author, 300,000-mile um, ocean white sailor, and incredibly great speaker. It's our pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. With yeah. that, the luncheon is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>